On July 13th, 1933, a reporter from the Moncton Daily Times is rushing towards the newly built wharfs on the tiny seaside village of Shediac. He's trying to make it in time to catch a glimpse of an incredible sight. 24 massive airplanes flying in a giant V formation that were arriving all the way from Italy with a dark political agenda. As the reporter pushes his way through the crowd numbering in the tens of thousands who had come to the small town from far and wide to see this historic moment, he spots an elderly local man named David Pottinger and approaches him, saying, Mr. Pottinger, 79 years ago, they drove nails into the head of steel at Shediac. The railway had come. I witnessed that historic occasion as an 11-year-old boy. In the old days, it took the train an hour to cover the 18 miles from Moncton to Shediac. Now, in my 90th year, I stand on the shore and watch General Italo Balbo's great fleet of 24 flying boats rear into Shediac. The leader of that historic flight, General Italo Balbo, was a man the Moncton Transcript newspaper described as handsome, energetic, and personable, with a youthful countenance wreathed in smiles, who spoke with a curious lisp. The newspaper, however, also alluded to dark deeds he had committed. Mr. Pottinger, as you stand here on the shore looking at the great Italian air armada, what are your thoughts? Pretty smart. You're listening to Backyard History, the hidden stories that happened in your own backyard the podcast version of the weekly history column running in newspapers across the Maritimes with your host and author, Andrew McLean. It was shortly before 3.30 standard time when they were first sighted, tiny specks in the distance, wrote the Evening Times Globe. The Moncton transcript continued. As the noise of their motors was heard in the distance, approaching the city from the east, many buildings seemed to empty as if by magic, their occupants rushing to the street or climbing to the roof to witness the spectacle. The Moncton Daily Times wrote, Their twin metal hulls gleaming silver in the sunlight. Sirens screamed a greeting as the big ship circled overhead and dropped down to the surface in threes at a time. Now back to the Evening Times glow. Metal wings glinting in the brilliant sun. Great motors roaring, 24 huge flying boats. Italy's air armada circled out of the blue northeastern sky and settled like giant gulls on sheltered Shediac Bay. Viva! shouted the crowd. In the early 1930s, the public was fascinated by flying. Airplanes were still new. The first ever flight had only taken place 30 years earlier. And now, planes were flying all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. However, in 1933, flying all the way across the Atlantic Ocean was rare and extremely risky. At the time, there had only been 78 transatlantic flights ever attempted, and only 28 actually made it all the way across the ocean. So basically, statistically speaking, pilots looking at flying across the ocean back then were looking at a two-thirds chance of dying along the way. This flight that was arriving was vastly more ambitious than anything ever tried before. The Italian Air Force were attempting to fly 24 massive silver flying boats in a giant V formation carrying 100 people all the way from Rome to Chicago, where the World's Fair was being held. This flight was unprecedented. Nothing like it had ever been seen before in all of human history, anywhere, ever. And they were stopping in this little Atlantic Canadian seaside resort town of Shediac, which was home to only 2,000 people. The whole world was following the historic flight. The Daily Times noted, A microphone from the Canadian Broadcasting Commission carried the voices of the speakers through a Dominion-wide hookup to the great radio audience of Canada. Meanwhile, there were some 20 cameramen from newsreels, which means basically video cameras, who were jockeying for the best position to film the Italian air armada's arrival. They would get their film as quickly as possible and then rush off to the airport where private planes were waiting to take them to the big American cities like New York City, Chicago, Boston, and Philadelphia, 
where they would try to be the first ones to publish the valuable footage. You can see plenty of these photos of the Italian Air Armada and Shediac on my website, backyardhistory.ca. The Evening Times Globe noted that Every newspaper and newspaper service were on edge waiting for the stories from Shediac that will bring its name into front pages. Newspaper men from Canada and the United States made the typewriters hum in Shediac as upwards of 30,000 words of copy were dispatched from here by the Canadian National Telegraphs. That newspaper would later publish a correction saying that it had actually been 50,000 words that the reporters had telegraphed to their editors from Shediac on that day. But why were all these planes going to Little Shediac, of all places? Well, Shediac was ideal for the flying boats to stop in to refuel and rest, because the land surrounding it was low, there was no current, it was sheltered, and the tides were predictable. The little town boasted two modern wharves, electricity, and telephone lines, as well as a nearby railway. For months, Italian soldiers had been in Shediac, preparing for the flight's arrival. They'd rented warehouses, office space, and imported thousands and thousands of liters of gas. They renovated the town's wharves, and they hired local people to make 2,200-pound anchors for the seaplanes. They even built a massive wireless station at the foot of Pleasant Street, a street which would soon be renamed Balbo Avenue in honor of the Italian Air Armada's leader. It would later be renamed back to Pleasant Street six years after, after Canada and Italy went to war. But all of that was in the future. On this day, the Canadians were rolling out the proverbial red carpet for the Italians. The Evening Times Globe newspaper said that, The scene was a brilliant one. Shediac gaily decked out for the occasion with flags and fluttering pennants, red, white, and green, the Italian colors. There were 100 people aboard the Italian Air Armada. They had spent the last two years preparing for the voyage. Each person on the flight had studied math, physics, aerodynamics, thermodynamics, navigation, and English. They'd spent winter in the mountains to learn survival skills in case of an emergency landing in the Atlantic. At 4.15 in the morning of June the 30th, they took off in Italy, flying over the Alps from Orbitello to Amsterdam. The next day, the seaplanes took off from Amsterdam to Derry, and then onwards to Reykjavik. On the way to Iceland, they had encountered heavy fog, and they tried to go under it flying only 30 meters above the waves of the icy Atlantic. Thousands of people had awaited them when they landed in Iceland, as well as the international press, keeping the public from all over the world updated on their progress. And then, for six days, they waited in Reykjavik for a bunch of bad weather to pass. A big 12-hour flight across the Atlantic to Labrador was the next step. Stockpiles of emergency supplies and camps had been set up in icy and rocky remote inlets all over Greenland and Labrador in case something went wrong on the flight. But the Italian Air Armada flew without incident to Cartwright in Labrador. There they again encountered bad weather and announced that they would be forced to stay there for two days because of the storms. But then, that very morning, the Italian Air Armada spotted a brief break in the bad weather, and with less than one hour's notice, their planes all took off, bound for Shediac. As the news began to circulate far and wide through radio that the Italian Air Armada would be arriving in six hours and 40 minutes, a madcap scramble began as people rushed to make it to the tiny town of Shediac to witness this historic moment. The St. John Globe newspaper reported. From the time it was known that General Balbo and his fleet had left Cartwright this morning, automobiles, motorcycles, horse-drawn vehicles, and other contraptions commenced their trek to Shediac. Thousands swarmed the beach from Gilbert's Corner to Sand Point, a distance of some five miles, while fields which a few weeks ago would have turned out many tons of hay were utilized by sightseers as parking grounds. 
For the organizers of the event, the fact that the Italians had spontaneously moved up their arrival date was a logistical nightmare, and one that they only had six hours to fix. The lead coordinator of the events, the legendary Maritimes historian J.C. Webster, later described the mad scramble to get everything ready for the ceremonies on short notice. We had arranged our program for July 14th, the date given by Captain Campanelli, the officer in charge of the small Italian force, which had been stationed in Shediac for several weeks. When, most unexpectedly, at 10.30 in the morning on the 13th, word came from New York that the Armada had left Cartwright. We were terribly upset, because those who were to take part in the celebrations were not expected to arrive before evening or the next morning. Concentrated efforts had to be made to get the Lieutenant Governor and Ministers to Shediac before the arrival of the Italians. We were successful. Despite the short notice, a staggering 30,000 people had arrived in the tiny town and were waiting to see the planes. The Evening Times described the scene. The crowd, although larger than this little town ever saw before, was orderly, and the scarlet-coated police who directed traffic through difficult channels handled the situation well. No serious accidents were reported, and very few minor ones. That newspaper described the moment when General Italo Balbo appeared for the first time. Not only was he the leader of the flight, who was not only the Italian Minister of Aviation, and at 37, the youngest cabinet minister in that country's government, but he was also the second in command of Benito Mussolini's fascist Italy. Finishing the hazardous Atlantic stretches of this epic mass flight and setting foot on Canadian soil for the first time, General Italo Balbo, Italy's smiling, bearded air envoy, stepped out of the cabin of his plane, showing no sign of fatigue or strain. His natty grey-blue uniform had not a wrinkle on it, his gold braid shone. His black shoes glistened and in his hand he carried a light cane and a pair of gloves. Viva! shouted the crowd as General Balbo, General Aldo Pellegrini, and Lieutenant Colonel Longo came ashore in a launch from the Canadian destroyer Sagne. General Italo Balbo was a pilot himself, with a particular flair for the dramatic, both in his personality and his flashy fashion choices. He had taken control of the Italian Air Force in 1928, and he was already a household name for a risky flight that he'd done earlier when he'd flown from Europe to Brazil. However, the Moncton transcript wasn't exaggerating when they had mentioned dark deeds he had committed. Today we tend to associate fascism with the Nazis in Germany, but by July of 1933, when the Italian air armada was coming to town, the Nazis were just mere newcomers to fascism. They'd only come to power six months earlier. The Nazis looked up to and idolized the man in the country that had invented fascism, Benito Mussolini, whose title was Il Duce, meaning the leader of Italy. Mussolini had, in 1919, single-handedly developed the ideology of fascism, which is a darkly authoritarian and nationalistic philosophy, which he basically invented from scratch. And he had quite the quick path to success with it, too. In 1919, he invented it, and he probably started his own political party. Only two years later, he was elected for the first time, and one year later, he had a coup, and he took over the government of Italy. The Italian general who was stepping off of the flying boat in Shediac's little harbor was not only Mussolini's second in command, but he was the mastermind of that coup that had overthrown Italy's democratic government. It had been Italo Balbo who had pushed to overthrow the Italian government when Mussolini had gotten cold feet. When Mussolini felt unsure that the 20,000 fascist black shirts he was leading in a march on Rome would be successful, the 28-year-old Italo Balbo had personally led that army into Rome to overthrow the democratic government. Mussolini, meanwhile, had actually stayed behind in Florence, fearful that his coup would fail. None of this was actually unknown to the people who had come from far and wide to see Italo Balbo and the Italian Air Armada. All of this was quite widely reported. In fact, that day, the Moncton transcript mentioned that Italo Balbo had personally ordered 
the murders of political opponents. They also noted that he had been accused of personally murdering an anti-fascist priest named Giovanni Minzoni. The 30,000 people who traveled to Shediac that summer day, though, were likely going there just to watch a modern technological marvel, an audacious statement on the possibilities of human endurance and ingenuity, rather than making a political statement in favor of fascism. And, by the way, there was nothing uniquely maritime about how people were fawning over the Italian fascists, though. Here's a weird bit of trivia for you. Did you know that the British government had actually given Mussolini a knighthood in 1923? Yeah, the fascist leader of Italy was actually Sir Benito Mussolini. Cheers went up from those assembled on Shediac Wharf as the vanguard of the Armada came into sight, and as the heavy purr of the motors swept past, the tumult increased, rising to one thunderous welcome. Before the boat had even reached the dock, which was lined with Canadian soldiers in their dress uniforms and mounties in their scarlet red coats, Italo Balbo leapt from it and landed on the wharf. Waiting for him was a small Italian delegation which had sailed to Shediac weeks before. It was led by his nephew, who he hugged and kissed warmly. The Canadian spectators were apparently somewhat startled by the kiss. He was then handed a package of telegrams by the editor of his personal newspaper back in Italy. One of the telegrams was from a particular big fan of the flight who was watching closely from Germany. Shediac's little post office had earlier received a telegram for Italo Balbo, which read, Congratulations on your thrilling achievement. Admiringly, Adolf Hitler. The tallow Balbo then pulled out a cigarette and he stuck it between his lips. He began patting around in his pockets and he kept patting. Turns out he'd forgotten his matches. He then received his first of many gifts he would receive in Canada when a man named Herman Merzetti handed him his box of matches. Rossetti had actually been born and raised in Italy himself and had immigrated to St. John 22 years earlier. He had risen to become a successful merchant in that city, like many Italian immigrants had. But he was actually there that day not to see the Armada, but was because he'd been hired by the local newspapers to act as an interpreter. As he lit a cigarette, the reporters pressed forward to ask questions. It quickly became apparent that the general, who famously portrayed himself as strongman Italio Balbo, was in fact actually pretty awkward. For example, the Evening Times Globe wrote, On the wharf, General Balbo briefly answered questions which eager newspaper men plied him through interpreters. From their musical Italian conversation, accompanied by gesticulating, the interpreters picked such meager phrases as, The water was good for landing, we had a fine trip. There was no trouble at all. There was some fog over the North Cape. The scenery was fine. I am glad to be in Canada. I want to rest, and I am here to fly, not anything else. As he spoke, falteringly, General Balbo, conqueror of the air trails and idol of Italy, seemed shy. Throughout the reception, he endeavored to shift out of the focus. He didn't have much luck in his efforts to squirm out of focus, though. He marched past a group of saluting Canadian soldiers, and then he returned their salute. And then he seemed a bit confused. According to the Evening Times Globe, a bystander pointed to a small footbridge over a ditch that he was supposed to cross to continue onwards to the main reception in the centre of town. The Italian general then lost his balance and began to fall towards the ditch. At the last minute, he caught himself and he hopped over the ditch to avoid falling in, and the newspaper wrote that he sheepishly gave an embarrassed grin to the watching crowd. It seemed that the infamous Italian strongman was somewhat more awkward in real life than his carefully cultivated media persona made him out to be. The Evening Times Globe described the scene. Tonight, thousands of additional autos and persons swelled the number to visit this town today to upwards of 25,000. And as darkness drew on the thousands of colored lights about the street, the square, the hotels, buildings, and private residences gave a real carnival appearance and drew many complimentary remarks from the visitors. Shediac may feel proud of her welcome, the Italians landed and will land in bigger centers, but it is doubtful that they will receive any more elaborate reception than given them by this enterprising town of some 2,000 people. The local people did try to give the Italians a warm welcome, 
but the 400 reporters that came to witness the spectacle were amused to find that while the locals had made many handmade signs featuring greetings in Italian, their spelling of the Italian words was often not really all that close to being accurate. One that made a photograph read Benvenuti. They were given the royal salute by the Rangers Honor Guard and marched to the Shediac Square, which was adorned with British and Italian flags. There a pavilion built outside of the Shediac Hotel hosted speeches paying tribute to the daring pilots and their feats of technology. The mayor, Alphonse Sormeni, gave a speech in French. New Brunswick is Canada's only bilingual province, so this does make sense. It was quite the flowery speech. The mayor said, More than 20 centuries ago, born of intrepid legions of intrepid emperors, the Roman eagles soared over the known world. Today, your mechanical eagles, very modern and gigantic, built by engineers to whom the science of aviation hold no secrets, have made a conquest of the new world, a world unknown to your ancestors, but which some of your compatriots, Christopher Columbus and Janusz Verrazano, discovered. Listeners may recall from the Backyard History Podcast episode called The Lost Colony that the very eccentric and frankly rather strange explorer Janus Verrazano was one of the first Europeans to ever visit the Maritimes hundreds of years before. And he had accidentally given the Bay of Fundy the name it has today through a really very complicated mix-up. The next speech was from the Lieutenant Governor. H. H. McLean, who is definitely no relation to me. I definitely don't have any wealthy and powerful officials in my family tree. The governor's speech was perhaps a little uncomfortably too pro Mussolini of a speech. He declared, I regard Mussolini as one of the great leaders of the world. He went on to quote Mussolini at length, and it emerged that the lieutenant governor saw him as a global peacemaker. He credited Mussolini as the force behind the international diplomacy called the Four Powers Agreement. His speech included the following lines, which would soon become darkly ironic. The treaty cited Rome's value lies in the affirmation of a peace pledge among the four major European powers to consult and work in unison to overcome their difficulties. The pact offers a fair prospect of ten years wherein the great experiment of disarmament may be tried without much fear, and it is hoped that the nation will discover that war is not necessary. Next, New Brunswick's Premier spoke. The Premier was then Leonard Tilly. Not his famous father, Sir Samuel Leonard Tilly, but this is the son who was only a Premier briefly and is largely forgotten. Arguably, the only thing of any interest he did in his short time as Premier was this speech. And much to everyone in the audience's astonishment, he delivered it in Italian. We're not talking a few opening words in Italian either, but the whole speech. The newspapers reported that the Italians were surprised but impressed by this, and the local people though were also surprised, but rather confused. Italo Balbo spoke too, rather briefly, and also in Italian, although in his case it makes a bit more sense than the Premier of New Brunswick delivering his whole speech in Italian. He largely paid tribute to Mussolini in an almost religious way, saying things like, It is through his courage, his initiative, his ability, that Italy becomes a greater power. The federal government, for its part, deliberately snubbed the whole affair. In fact, Prime Minister William Loins Mackenzie King, who is the guy on Canada's $50 bill today, didn't even issue a perfunctory congratulatory statement to the Italians. After the speeches were over, the Canadian military band played the national anthem, and then they played the fascist hymn. This was Italy's new national anthem, and it involved singing Hip Hip Hooray for Mussolini several times. After that, the dignitaries headed for the waiting cars to take them to the formal dinner. In a stunningly awkward mix-up, though, General Italo Balbo managed to somehow accidentally miss the car that was waiting for him. As tens of thousands of people looked on, he walked up to a random car with an average Canadian citizen sitting inside of it and got in. 
The Canadian authorities quickly collected him and escorted him back to his proper vehicle. Unfortunately, there don't seem to be any interviews with the person whose car the second in command of fascist Italy accidentally got into, but presumably they were pretty surprised. The leaders of the Italian Air Armada, along with several other high profile dignitaries, were then taken to the home of J.C. Webster, one of the finest historians New Brunswick ever produced. He hosted a dinner party that evening to celebrate the successful flight in his massive mansion in Shediac. It was attended by prominent officials from the RCMP and from the Canadian Army, as well as politicians and dignitaries, some of whom had traveled all the way from the United States. Now, apparently there was a lot more money and respect for historians back then than there is today, because believe it or not, I have not actually been asked once to host a single visiting dignitary in my tiny little one-bedroom apartment. According to the CBC's Maritime Comment radio show from April 17, 1950, Marshal Balbo, in his immaculate white uniform, was taken to the Webster residence where he was greeted by a salute from a tiny 18th century cannon. A historical relic which Dr. Webster kept on his lawn for such outstanding visitors. Balbo was startled, but flattered and delighted. Just before he passed away, nearly two decades after these events, J.C. Webster wrote a short autobiography of his very eventful life. He privately published only a handful of these books, and he gave them away to his family members. I managed to track down and get my hands on one of these copies, with some difficulty. In it, J.C. Webster revealed that he had been the force that had pushed for the events to be held in Shediac. While in Ottawa, I had secured the promise of the Dominion government to hold the official welcome in Shediac instead of Montreal. Thereafter, I had a busy time in coordinating the activities of the Dominion, province, and town, and work was energetically carried out by them. Finally, all was ready. The Armada arrived in the latter part of the afternoon of the 13th. The 24 huge planes descending and taking their places at the anchorages prepared for them by Captain Campanelli and his men. This wonderful performance was witnessed by many people from many places, who had hastened to Shediac in the course of a few hours. General Balbel, Colonels Longo and Cagna were our guests, and we had dinner for them in the evening. At J.C. Webster's dinner party, celebrating the Italian aviators, the menu was tomato soup, lobster, chicken salad, fruit, tea, and coffee. Italo Balbo and his top officers would spend the night sleeping in Webster's mansion. I don't want to leave you the impression that J.C. Webster was a fascist sympathizer, though. He was the social elite of Shediac and owned a big mansion and held these grand and famously lavish parties that were widely covered by the press. Um, if having all of these aviators in his home bothered Webster at all, it likely would have been not for political reasons, but for some really painful personal ones. His oldest son, Johnny, who was a well-known and daring stunt pilot only two years earlier, died competing in a flying contest in Montreal when his plane crashed. Fascism would actually cost the Webster family dearly. J.C. Webster's only daughter, Janet, would later die in a Nazi concentration camp. Meanwhile, the Webster's youngest son, Bill, would secretly become a high-level official working on the Manhattan Project that developed the nuclear bomb. He was horrified when he learned the sheer destructiveness of that bomb that he had helped create, and he would quit the project in protest, return to Shediac, and become something of an enigmatic recluse. Actually, I really should do a future episode on the Websters, who are an immensely fascinating but deeply tragic family. So you can look out for that episode in the future. So why all of the support for fascism anyways? Basically, to really simplify things, it was just a question of public relations. Or marketing. Uh, Mussolini and the fascists in general were really good at using this brand new mass media with their focus on short, catchy quotes and great images to portray themselves in the way that they wanted. They also lied about the accomplishments they didn't necessarily do. For example, they didn't actually construct this aviation program that allowed this record-breaking flight to fly across the ocean. They had inherited what was already the world's greatest aviation program 
from the democratic Italian government, which they had overthrown. Italo Balbo, in particular, was something of a mastermind of public relations. Recall how his personal newspaper editor met him on the wharf. He knew how to control an image, although in person he seems to have been a bit of an awkward bumbler, as we've seen. The only obvious sign that anyone was upset with the fascists coming to Shedia came that night. Several Canadian Navy sailors from the HMCS Saguenay were arrested for breaking in and ransacking a special railway coach the Italians had brought for the press to work from. The next morning, a crowd assembled again at 7 a.m. to watch the planes depart, but they were delayed for three and a half hours due to Italo Balbo sleeping in. (laughs) Or, as a fawning newspaper report, more politely phrased it, due to Italo Balbo having the longest continued period of uninterrupted rest he had since leaving Italy. During that time, the Italians mingled with the New Brunswickers, and newspapers noted that although some struggled with English, most were able to speak French with the locals. The Moncton Daily Times recounted a young woman teaching an Italian pilot to say, I love you. From there, Italo Balbo's Air Armada flew to Montreal and then onwards to Chicago, where a crowd of 100,000 people watched their arrival. They were lavish with praise and gifts in the United States. Balbo had streets named after him. He dined with the president. He spoke to an adoring sold-out crowd at Madison Square Garden. A ticker tape parade was held from him down the streets of New York City, which an estimated one million people showed up to watch. All of this adulation wouldn't exactly help Italo Balbo's career, though. Upon his return to Italy, he found that Mussolini had become suspicious and jealous of his international fame. Suspecting that his longtime second in command to him had become a threat, Mussolini sent him away from the capital to the Italian colony of Libya, where he would be out of the way. Italo Balbo would be killed in Libya in 1940 during the Second World War by his own Italian anti aircraft gunners who mistook his plane. For a British fighter. When the nearby British pilots who were fighting against the Italians heard of his unexpected death, they thought back to that historic flight that he had made across the Atlantic Ocean seven years earlier. British fighter pilots flew over the charred remains of the wreckage of the aircraft General Italo Balbo had died on and dropped a single funeral wreath from their planes. Attached to it was a note paying tribute to his contributions to aviation. That was Backyard History with your host, Andrew McLean. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for another hidden story that happened in your own backyard. Produced by Jordan Lozier.